This is BBC Two. Now an extended news night. They say all politics is local. It's not true, of course, but sure as hell a lot of it is. And in this election, the outcome will be determined in different seats around the country. So tonight, we're out and about in battleground Britain. Three constituencies, each chosen for a specific reason, which you'll hear about shortly. This is Bishop Auckland, the beautiful market town in County Durham, in the election battleground of the northeast of England. And I'm 200 miles south in the Hertfordshire town of Stevenage. The town motto, the heart of a town lies in its people. We're taking that to heart. We'll be speaking to a group of floating voters. And I'm in the borders. Scotland is a very different battleground indeed. We'll hear why this seat of Berwickshire, Roxburgh and Selkirk is so important. And I've also been speaking to Alex Salmond. Hello, welcome to Bishop Auckland. I'm standing here outside the town hall behind me with 30 days to go until the election. So what are we up to tonight? Well, it's easy to watch our programme or any other and to get the impression that an election is just a contest fought between party leaders on a national stage. Certainly it felt like that today with Theresa May and husband Philip on the one show sofa and Jeremy Corbyn launching his campaign. But we're going to ignore both of those stories tonight because for good or ill, we have a voting system that also makes our election 650 local contests. Each seat has its own candidates, its own local parties and its own personality. And with national party loyalties in an elasticated state at the moment, local action is often where it's at. So tonight we've ditched the studio, we've come out and about in battleground Britain. We are in three ordinary constituencies chosen because the way their voters turn on June the 8th could help deliver three very different futures for Britain. A little later in the programme, we'll be off to the Conservative seat of Stevenage in Hertfordshire. The seat is number 50 on Labour's target list, and we're dropping in to look at the Labour in power scenario. If Labour can win Stevenage, they're probably the largest party in the Commons. It's a London commuter belt town, but it's a long way from the metropolis. It voted leave for a start, and the Tories were 5,000 votes ahead last time. But the constituency voted Labour throughout the Blair heydays. We'll also visit the Berwickshire, Roxburgh and Selkirk constituency for a different scenario. This is an SNP seat, but is number three on the Tories' UK target list. A comfortable Tory victory there takes us to the Conservative consolidation outcome, a modest increase in Theresa May's majority. A rural seat, it spans a large portion of southeastern Scotland. Most voters here backed unionist parties last time. Will that help the Tories take it and signify a resurgence for the party in Scotland? They only need 328 votes to win it. But our first stop is here in Bishop Auckland. A Labour seat now, this is number 46 on the Tory target list. And a win would suggest we're looking at the Tory landslide scenario, with a majority of around 100. This has a long history, but its economy has been shaped by the rise and fall of the coal mines here. Today, the Conservatives need a 4.5% swing from Labour to clinch it. They came within 328 votes of winning it last time. Well, with me here is our political editor, Nick Watts. Nick, we're on landslide watch here. 46th on the Tory target list. Is it realistic to think they can win it? Well, the polling experts, Colin Rawlings and Michael Thrasher, have said if the Conservatives win this seat, Bishop Auckland, then they would have a majority of 100, and that is, as you say, landslide territory. Now, some recent opinion polls have suggested maybe we're heading that way. Guardian ICM poll yesterday gave the Conservatives a 22-point lead, though other polls have shown that it's a little narrower than that. But if we go back to our polling gurus, Rawlings and Thrasher, they were quite cautious and they suggested that those local election results last week implied a swing from Labour to the Conservatives of 2.5%, and that wouldn't really get you into a landslide. It would be a Tory majority, Tory majority of 60, not bad. Who would complain? <laughs> but that's only 10 above the figures that ministers are saying would make this early election worthwhile. What, I mean, if, it, if, it did, if we're talking about this scenario, our, our scenario one today, 
What would the impact of that be? Well, I think it's something that our age group would refer to as a Basildon moment. That was that moment in 1992 that showed that the Tories were going to get a fourth successive general election victory. This seat has not been Labour since 1935, when not Hugh, been since when 19... Hugh, not uh, sorry, it's been Labour since 1935, yeah. when Hugh Dalton recaptured it from the National Liberals. He, of course, was the Labour Chancellor who inadvertently leaked his budget in 1947. But look, after spending two days here. I would say that the Tories have quite a big hurdle to climb, which is entrenched Labour support, even from Labour voters who have doubts about Jeremy Corbyn. But, big card possibly for the Tories, there's a reasonable UKIP vote here, and if that splits, those 7,000 votes split, as the way opinion polls show they will, maybe the Tories will get across the line. Thanks, Nick. Nick has spent the last couple of days here in Bishop Auckland, just finding out what those who live here think and asking whether this town will stay Labour or help give the Conservatives a landslide win. Over the barren landscape of the North Pennines and the gentler pastures of the Teesdale Valleys sits a rural idyll. Medieval castles and grand houses pepper the western half of the Bishop Auckland constituency. But this is a parliamentary seat of two halves as you head east into former coal mining areas, you see telltale signs of post-industrial decline. There's real rural poverty as well as urban poverty. Lots of people struggling, struggling to make ends meet in their lives. So there's a, a, there's a lot of the just about managing people that get talked about. Um, and there are, there are those who uh, go from one job to another. Uh, they're worried about permanence. They're worried about stability. Theresa May would dearly love to win this seat, which has been in Labour hands since 1935. The Prime Minister should have little difficulty in picking up votes in the more prosperous parts of the constituency. The hope will be that her central message about championing ordinary working families will help win over Labour and UKIP voters in the more deprived areas. Success for the Tories, who were buoyed by their victory in the nearby Tees Valley mayoral contest, may depend in large part on whether Labour voters are prepared to support their leader. One lifelong supporter will be casting his ballot for Labour, but with little enthusiasm. He's too idle to shave, and he, he's, he's a bit... Don't, he's not right. He's not a Labour, I would say, top man. He's got to get himself sorted, because if not, we're going down the swanee. His friend Danny isn't going to vote at all. Labour. No backbone whatsoever. I'm, I won't vote for Labour now. Labour will get in round here, no problem at all. But there's no leadership. So there are strong doubts about Jeremy Corbyn in the Bishop Auckland Labour heartlands. But head over to the leafier side where the Tories can count on strong support and you'll see signs of that Corbyn fan club. I think the media are saying that Jeremy Corbyn isn't very good. I think he's a very good leader and I think he stands his ground. And uh, yeah, I've, I uh, joined the Labour Party because, because to get him in. The contrasting views show that nothing is straightforward about this seat, where the picture on the ground is more nuanced than raw polling numbers would suggest. Apathy may be a strong factor, and Bishop Auckland is no longer a straight Labour-Tory fight. Theresa May will only prevail if she can eat into 7,000 UKIP votes. Tell me why you vote UKIP. Because uh, the immigration in this country is out of control. And there are some people who are saying that UKIP, in a sense, have done their job. We're out of the EU. Mm. Sort of speak. I, I, no, I don't agree with that. It's not, it's not job done, is it? Half a job. Tories tend not to put their heads above the parapet in Bishop Auckland. But one mum of an aspiring ping pong champion is full of praise for Theresa May. I do like her, and I. Basically, coming from the feminist point of view, I like that we've got a woman again. Um, I think she's a strong character. Um, I like the things that she said about Brexit. Um, and I think probably a lot of people are thinking like that. I think she's a strong leader, and I think that helps the shift from Labour to Tory. Um, yeah, I don't think Labour have got a lot going for them at the moment. <laughs>
And there are even Labour voters who praise the Prime Minister. I think she's very strong. I think she's, she won't take anything. I think she's, she'll be a good candidate and she'll stand strong in terms of Brexit. But I don't believe in the Conservative policies, really. If the Tories do win this seat, it could well be remembered as a seismic moment in British politics. It would be significant because it would say something about what was happening across the nation as a whole, um, which uh, might surprise people if this seat particularly went to, to Conservative. In this overlooked corner of North East England, visitors would barely know an election is underway. Many people told us they are simply uninterested and the greatest noise issues not from election loud hailers, but from one of England's most spectacular waterfalls. Nick Watt there. Well, arguably the grand divide in England exposed by the referendum last year was between big cities like Manchester and London and secondary towns and cities that tended to vote more enthusiastically for Brexit, like this one, Bishop Auckland. It is that divide that might or might not be reshaping the party loyalties of the seats we think of as naturally Labour or Tory. Let's reflect on what's changing. With a couple of politicians from the region, I'm joined by James Wharton, former Northern Powerhouse Minister. He's been the Conservative MP for Stockton South and is standing there again. And Chi Onwara, who's been the Labour MP for Newcastle upon Tyne Central since 2010 and uh, has been a shadow business minister. Very good evening to you both. You. Uh, Chief, first of all, what do you think is happening here among Labour loyal, well, but among traditional Labour voters? Is there some sense of them switching away? Well, I think what we're seeing is that we have a, we have Brexit divided the country and uh, divided um, northern voters as well. And 58% of northern of northern voters voted to leave. And the the, the Conservative Party having taken on UKIP's language and mantle is attracting some of them. But what I am finding on the doorstep, and you know, we've got um, many fantastic candidates taking our message into the communities, is that the Labour vote, the memory of the last of the Tory government and the cuts to public services combined with the fact that people do not feel better off. People know that we are 10% on average worse off than when the Conservatives first came into power. That is still a message that resonates. Are you resonates. expecting to lose some seats in the North East though, Labour seats in the North East? We are fighting for every vote That's and the polls the, the poll suggest, the poll suggest that um, we, may, we may experience losses but and on the day itself I think people will remember what a Tory what's, government what's means. What's your experience James Orton? Uh, well I'd be surprised if we don't take seats in the North East. The question is where and how many and what the reasons are that underlie that. Yeah, what are and the reasons? Why well, do I think, you think it is? I think for a long time, actually, a lot of people who voted Labour in the North East have actually been quite distant from those who've represented them. The views of the MPs have often been very, very different to those of the traditional Labour voters who've put them in office. Uh, Brexit is one big reason. It's highlighted that. Nearly all of the Labour MPs in this region supported Remain. M an awful lot of the Labour voters supported Leave and they found that there wasn't a voice for them and they're looking elsewhere. So that's the picture which we've heard about. What do you say, Chief, to Labour voters when they say, I don't, you know, I, I don't think I'm, I, I might not vote Labour? What, 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 or I don't like Jeremy Corbyn. We know that these voters exist. What do you say to them? I say to Labour voters who are thinking of switching to Tory, I say that if in two years' time you will be lying at, awake at night out of the guilt of what the Tories are doing to our schools, to our NHS and to our economy and your responsibility for that. And for James to say that our, our, our candidates, our MPs, have not been rooted in their communities, when the Tory party is full of people who cannot even imagine what it is like to take a bus, never mind to go to oh, a food no, bank okay, or to have answer. a zero hour contract. Let, let James answer. No, I've, I've lived in the North East all my life. I've seen the complacency of many of the Labour politicians in the region and indeed the arrogance of some of them. Uh, I think the reality is the big thing we face in this country going forward, and people know this, is going to be Brexit, is going to be getting that deal and going through that process. And there is a choice in this election between Theresa May and her strong and stable leadership or the, oh. or the chaos, or the chaos of right. Jeremy Corbyn. Let's, 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 let's just ask about the pitch to Northern England of each of your parties. Because, gee, one of the most interesting things, it was, it was the Tories who came up with this Northern powerhouse slogan who seemed to have a vision or an ambition for the North. You must feel terrible that Labour didn't talk about it in that way for so long. 
Labour has always been rooted in our industrial heartlands. What and what, what Labour's vision for is, what? is for a resurgent industry. And we know what industry means. It means jobs, it means good quality give jobs, me, give making me and thing. building one things. One thing that is the policy, the industrial strategy. You're the uh, shadow, I'm the shadow minister. minister what, for, for industrial, industrial stra strategy. strategy. Just give me one, in two sentences, what is the industrial strategy? The industrial strategy is to invest in our transport, to invest in our innovation infrastructure, to invest in our communities and in our skills for lifelong learning so that we have the skilled people to deliver the skilled jobs, which mean high wages. Right. It means that we can co compete internationally and globally. James Wharton, you were the Northern Powerhouse Minister in, uh, until last summer. What's happened to that? What's actually going on? Well, what just last doing? week, we saw the first mayor for in the North East region elected uh, in the Tees Valley. And in Cambridge and in the South and, and in so other regions, but there are more in the North than anywhere. There's more in the North than anywhere else. And with, with, with that comes significant devolutions, giving new powers. Well, Transport ago, for the North has been established. Ago, three years ago, three years ago, George Osborne talked about High Speed 3. This was going to link Manchester to Leeds. This was going to be an East-West thing that would make northern cities more than the sum of the parts. What, what's happened to I that? Gonna, When's it going to be finished? Yeah, I think you're going to see big differences. When's it going to be finished? Well, when will it be finished? You don't finish a project of economic rebalancing okay. economic growth. But here's when an, is here's it going a, to start? Here, well, here's when an it, example where, for you. When yeah, is it going to start? So we've, we've just seen devolution delivered in Tees Valley. significant talking, money. But what we're, about we're the trains seeing, that you asked about trains. There are every single train that goes, the east-west trains, the old pace trains, will be replaced by 2022. These are big investments that have been needed for years that haven't been delivered, that the Conservatives Conservatives are delivering for the north of England. One billion pounds in north eastern transport. So that will mean that our economy can have workers moving around and businesses growing. And we'll set up a bank of the north, which will attract investment here okay. and also control that investment. To, is it your contention? that the Northern Powerhouse is on track and being delivered to the people of the north of I England. I think the government is making is a big... Is it being delivered? I think it is. It's making a it big... Is. It is. It so is. They but know they what you mean. But, when you but, say Northern Powerhouse, but, but let's be, it's what they've got. Let's, be, that that let's be clear. You can't change something that dramatically overnight. You're going to see Seven new trains. Years. You're seeing a £450 million pound devolution years. deal in Teesside. You're seeing this, the shape of politics across the north of England is changing. Uh, and people are doing that. We saw that in the vote of a Ben Houch and a Conservative mayor in Tees Valley. An investment is going to follow it. Cutting investment. We have you doubled the debt under the Tories, and okay. we have no improvement in there. our industry the battle, as a consequence. It's going to be Jeremy Corbyn or Theresa May, Chi, and you know it. It's going to be Jeremy Corbyn. That's it from Bishop Auckland for now. I shall return briefly later, but the next leg on this UK tour is Berwickshire and Kirsty is there. Kirsty. Thanks, Evan. Well, good evening from Abbotsford in the heart of the Scottish borders, the home of Sir Walter Scott, who did more than his fair share to forge both a new Scottish identity and the idea of Scotland's place in Britain. We're here because constituencies like this are the kind the Conservatives need to win if they're to consolidate their majority. But more than that, this election serves to emphasise how much Scotland is another country. For many here, this is a return to the arguments of the 24 independence referendum. Nicola Sturgeon says it's a chance to put Scotland in Scotland's hands. Ruth Davidson, after a Tory surge at last week's local elections, says it's an opportunity for unionists to prevail. For Labour, who took a drubbing in the locals and even managed to lose Glasgow Council, the question is whether this election brings a fight back or a wipeout. The resurgence of the Tories appears to be a direct result of the dominance of the SNP. In power in Scotland for more than a decade, the last general election was a triumph when they took all but three Westminster seats. So this election is for the heart and soul of Scotland. But if the Conservatives gain even a handful of seats, it will contribute to the idea that they're the only party who could command a majority across Britain. Scotland has been at the heart of seismic shifts in politics in the last 20 years. In 1997, Labour in Scotland was the backbone of Tony Blair's landslide victory. The Conservatives were all but dead in the water and the SNP were treading it. Ten years later, the Scottish National Party formed a minority administration in Holyrood and have been in power ever since. Now they command the heights of Scotland at Westminster. But people are beginning to ask whether we've reached peak Nat and how that would play into a second independence referendum for Scotland. When Nicola Sturgeon announced there would be a second referendum,
did that galvanise unionism in Scotland? So we've got this odd paradox going on in Sc Scottish politics now, where the unionist parties want to talk about, about independence because they know they've got this 55% majority against it. And the SNP want to talk about other things because they know that, that, that they actually are, are more in tune with the views of the Scottish people on social policy, on Europe, on social justice, on public spending and all of that. There's always been tactical voting here, but this time, it may have a radically different effect than before, freezing Labour out. Labour is in a terrible, terrible position, very, very weak, the weakest that I've ever seen the party. I think what's happening is that people are saying, well, another independence referendum, you know, we don't want that. We don't want to, 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 to wrangle over this question, which we think we settled in 2014. And so what's happening is that they're voting Conservative because they position themselves clearly clearly as the party that will fight against another referendum. If the Conservatives are going to take any seats from the Nationalists, this one, Berwickshire, Roxburgh and Selkirk is first on the hit list. They just need a swing of 328 votes. I'm in Hoyk though and here's the conundrum. This was once the centre of the textile industry but a combination of automation and globalisation has decimated the number of mills. Now they're worried about Brexit. Hoiko is a family firm founded in the town in 1874. It makes luxury cashmere clothing which is exported all over the world. 60% of those exports go to Europe. Brexit for us is by far and away the, the biggest issue for us as a, as a company. Uh, Scottish independence, um, all the uncertainty that we have with all that is our single biggest sort of issues. Well, the view of the management might be clear, but there are some surprises among the workforce. I've never voted Tory in my life, and I've detested Tories all my life, but this time I've got to vote Tory because it's, it's really, can I vote to come out? I vote to stay together, so I have to vote Tory. They say that Ruth Davidson's detoxified the Tories. Do you think that's right? No, no. no. I'm a staunch SNP party man, but um, I'm not really wanting another referendum because we, we've had the result already, and, and I think they're just sort of playing on it now. Alistair Moffat farms just a few miles from here. He feels the apparent conundrum of this election particularly strongly as a borderer. Because we are a frontier people and have been for you know almost a, th a thousand years, um, we don't see the frontier people on the other side of the tweed as being different. People want to stay in the British Union, so they'll vote Conservative to avoid another unnecessary referendum as they see it. But also the Conservatives are apparently embracing a hard Brexit. They want out, and many people here do not want to leave the European Union. In rural England, a seat like this would have been safe Tory territory. But for years, even before the rise of the SNP, this was a Liberal rather than a Conservative stronghold. It will be here that we discover whether Ruth Davidson has done enough to detoxify the Tories north of the border. Well, what would a Conservative land grab in Scotland mean for the question of independence? Nicola Sturgeon surprised many by using the backdrop of Brexit to call for a second referendum earlier this year. But could Theresa May have outmanoeuvred her with her snap election? And if so, what would the SNP do next? Well, I caught up earlier this evening with the party's former leader, Alex Salmond. I asked him what he would regard as a mandate for independence in this election. This election will not decide independence. Independence will be decided in a referendum. So that will well, that, definitely that's a, happen. That's the established policy of the, the, the Scottish National Party. Th this election will decide whether the decisions about Scotland's future should remain in Scotland's hands. That these are decisions to be made by the Scottish Parliament and the Scottish people, not to be dictated to by Theresa May. And that's what a, an SNP victory in this election will reinforce. But uh, you're not sure of victory yet, you can't, no, nobody I, I, can. I, you, you asked me what would happen <laughs> if yes. the SFV... So no, can, I, can I just say that, unlike the uh, rather uh, presumptuous, uh, vainglorious announcements from the Conservative Party about what they're going to win, the SNP have never taken a single seat or a single vote for granted, so we'll let the electorate decide. You talk about Ruth Davidson saying it's a vainglorious mm. boast to take Gordon your own seat. Mm. But you've said things like independence is inevitable. It's just generational. 
That's a vainglorious boast. Well, well to, to say that, uh, that independence is a movement of Scottish politics towards independence, and it's as certain as anything can ever be in politics, that's not the same thing as saying I'm going to, I'm going to overturn the 20,000 majority in, in this seat. But no, I but you, mind, you, you, but you were 6,500 majority well, in the last general election. Not over the Tories. I had 20,000 majority but, over but the let's Conservative see. Party. But I think I, let's, let's broaden this from my seat. I mean, the, the Tories have this always extending list of seats are going to gain. I'm merely saying that in the northeast of Scotland and in the borders of Scotland uh, and in the, any common sense area of Scotland, that the people who make vainglorious boasts before an election can often be brought down to earth with a large bump. You could say that you would be making a vainglorious boast between a second independence referendum because you have said mm. independence is inevitable, it's just generational. You don't well, know no, that. It's a generational thing. I, I think the, the movement, in, uh, my, my belief has always been that, that once the key decision was to establish the Scottish Parliament, once the Scottish Parliament was established, then it would increase in its hands its powers over a period of time. Uh, that was a, a process which was as near inevitable as anything you could get in politics. I've always said the exact timing of when that happens and how it happens, that's for political but debate you, and for the Scottish people to decide. But do you but the accept that? I think they say the destination is what is said. The, the route and the number of stops you have on the way, that's more difficult to determine. But that's so interesting you say the destination is set. So what you're essentially saying is the Scottish people could deliver no message at this general election which would indicate that they don't want a second independence referendum. That's quite a thing to no, say. No, no, the, Sc the Scottish people, the, my whole basis in being in politics is to let Scotland decide. But what I'm saying is that once we establish the Scottish Parliament, in this sense, that we're, we're sitting here uh, not far from the Livgo, and the, the late Tam Diel uh, stayed in the bins a, a few minutes from here. And Tam and I disagreed on, on many, many things in politics about the establishment mm. of the Scottish Parliament. But the one thing we agreed on is once you established a national parliament in Scotland, it would, over a period of time, accrue the powers and become an independent parliament. The people decide the timetable, they decide when that happens. But that is a, a process, not but an event. Two years ago, the SNP got half the vote mm. in the general election. If that figure is significantly lower in this election, are you saying that irrespective of how they voted in Brexit, they don't want independence? No, what, I, what I'm saying is that the, the SNP will go into this election looking for every vote in every possible constituency, uh, striving hard to, to be win the election, and you judge the winning of an election by the party gets the most seats and the most, most votes, but, and you don't take anything for granted. But if the direction of travel, can I just ask you, yeah. if the direction of travel in this election is that Ruth Davidson mm. moves and takes a number of seats, including perhaps, first of all, Berwickshire, which has got a very, very slender majority, mm. and takes or a number Gordon of seats... With the 20, or Gordon with the 20,000th majority. Yeah, yeah, because if, in fact, everybody tactically voted against you, on the same turnout, on the same percentage uh, of the vote, uh, you'd be why, out. Why wouldn't they tactically vote against the Conservatives who are disliked? Listen, I, I saw an interesting figure in the poll <clears throat> a couple of weeks ago. It didn't ask how people were voting. It said, look to the parties and said, do you like this party? 53% of people in Scotland like the SNP. The figure for the Conservative Party was 24%. But you haven't got over the 50% hurdle for a second independence referendum. I'm interested well, in the fact that you will, go for an in, you will go for a second independence well, referendum no matter what the result of this election no, no. is. The mandate for the second referendum was last year. The decision on what happens at this election is a matter for the people of Scotland. But you judge whether you win or lose an election by winning the most seats and the most votes. And on that criteria, the Scottish National Party have won every major election in Scotland since 2010. Alex Hamm, thank you very much. It's a pleasure, thank you. Well, I'm joined here beside Sir Walter Scott's fireplace uh, by the election supreme and sophologist John Curtis, who crunches the numbers at the University of Strathclyde, and by Alex Massey, Scotland editor of The Spectator. Good evening to you all. Of course, Alex Am is technically right. They have the mandate for a second referendum. But do you think there's anything in this e election by way of a reverse that could actually alter their thinking on that? Uh, not to alter the SNP's thinking, and you are, of course, quite correct that, uh, you know, in a technical sense, or if you prefer it in a factual sense, yeah. the SNP already have their mandate for a, uh, a second referendum, a vote authorising the Scottish Government mm. to pursue this was passed at the Scottish Parliament uh, a few weeks ago. However, politics isn't just about 
facts and technicalities. It is also about perception. And hitherto, the SNP have done very well with capitalising on a sense of inevitability, that momentum is with them, that the hour of national liberation, if you like, is at hand. And so if they were to lose seats in this election, as I think most people expect them yeah. to do so, that would check that uh, momentum. They will remain the largest party. They will win the Scottish yeah. portion of this election. But they will see uh, a setback remains a setback, and that will embolden Conservatives who yeah. think we can push this further down the line. So it suits uh, Ruth Davison to make this election uh, to do with the union as much as it suits uh, Nicola Sturgeon. It might actually not suit Nicola Sturgeon to make it about the union. It makes suits N N um, Ruth Davidson. Well, the truth is that ever since the independence referendum of 2014, the constitutional question has been the central issue of Scottish yeah. electoral politics. And to that extent, at least, you know, this election is simply a continuation yeah. of that process. All right. Um, now, the truth is what's happened is not so much that SNP support has gone down that heavily, but rather that the Conservative Party has become much more successful at bringing the unionist vote within its cap. And essentially, it's been taking votes from the Labour Party during the last two years or so. Now, the other thing which is true is you know, the SNP is defending a quite remarkable baseline. 50% of the vote, 56 out of 59 seats, very, very difficult to repeat. And in a sense, the difficulty for the SNP in particular is you can see what happened in last year's Scottish Parliament election. The Conservatives are doing well in certain yeah. parts of Scotland, here along the border with England, up in the North East, and that's something that's repeated in last week's local elections. The Liberal Democrats equally picking off places like Fife North East yeah. and Edinburgh West. And therefore, as a result, uh, the SNP are finding that the anti-SNP vote yeah, is congregating cool. yeah. against particular parties, particular constituencies, making it more difficult for them to win. And, of course, there is this idea that now we've always had tactical voting, but there are particular areas where it looks as if the best candidate, the unionist candidate, the best one of whatever of the other three parties, will be the one that they coalesce around, in particular areas, for example, in the city of Edinburgh. Well, absolutely. I mean, that was what we saw at last year's Scottish mm. parliamentary elections. I think we can expect to see a non-aggression pact between the unionist parties in Edinburgh that could, if, every, if everything fell their way, leave... You know, Edinburgh, like Berlin, divided into four zones. You'd have <laughs> the Liberal Democrats in Edinburgh West, the Tories in Edinburgh South West, Labour in Edinburgh South, and the largest zone, uh, like the Soviets, would be the SNP. Um, now, whether that actually happens, a lot needs to go right for the Unionist parties for that to transpire. But it is certainly possible. We see a breakdown in tribalism, mm -hmm. particularly amongst Conservative voters mm -hmm. who are happy to endorse a Labour candidate or a Liberal Democrat candidate if that candidate is the person best placed to, to defeat the SNP because it is you are either on team SNP or team anti-SNP in Scotland and that's the fundamental baseline of Scottish politics. But, but one of the big stories in Scotland may well be that actually what happens to Labour after this election. We don't know, obviously know what the result will be yet but there are certainly even questions about whether Corbyn should actually be in election literature. Well, yeah, sure. I mean, the party is only defending one seat in Edinburgh South, and it's pretty, uh, pretty uh, uh, vulnerable. That, and the truth is, in the local elections, the Labour Party fell to third yet again, as they did in last year's uh, Scottish Parliament election. That said, however, I think my reading of what, where we're at is actually, although the Labour Party is down in Scotland, it's not quite out. It still managed to get a fifth of the vote here in the local elections. And to that extent, at least, the gap mm. between them and the Conservatives is still sufficiently narrow that actually the battle for who is going to be the principal party of unionism in Scotland has not yet been won and lost. Basic, 10 seconds, does Ter Theresa may have to tread carefully in tone in Scotland? Uh, in the long term, yes. Uh, you know, Whitehall and Westminster and Downing Street are very good at thinking about this week, next month, uh, six months from now and so on. But the battle for Scotland won't be decided uh, this year or even next year. This is a matter of five years, ten years down the line. Thank you both very much indeed. Well, that's it from here in Berwickshire. Let's hand over now to David Grossman and Stevenage. David. Thank you, Kirsty, and welcome to the Cromwell Hotel in Old Stevenage. It's been a coaching inn since the 16th century, and at one time it was the home to Oliver Cromwell's spymaster, John Thurlow. One secret that, of course, no one knows the answer to is where the seat is going to go at the general election. It's currently in Conservative hands, but if Jeremy Corbyn can retake it for Labour, well, history suggests he'll go on to be Prime Minister. It's currently 50th on Labour's target list. Where better to recapture the spirit of these ventures than at Stevenage, Hertfordshire, where in the town centre, known as phase one of the overall plan, we can see... Stevenage was designed, a new town to help solve Britain's post-war housing problems. The new A1 motorway, 
and aerospace jobs gave it a futuristic feel. It was the sort of place Harold Wilson had high hopes for. The Britain that is going to be forged in the white heat of this revolution. I'm afraid that the answer to that is rather rude to a minority of people. This was natural labour territory. In 1964, a young hopeful, Shirley Williams, became MP for the area, although boundary changes mean it's a different seat today. Since the seat of Stevenage was created, whichever party has won here has gone on to win the country. 440. The victory of millionaire Blairite Barbara Follett in 1997 was emblematic of New Labour's triumph. At the last general election, the Conservatives got 44.5% of the vote, with Labour 10 points behind. The Conservative majority of a shade under 5,000 votes may seem like a big enough mountain for Labour to scale on its own. But consider this. At the last general election, UKIP polled 6,800 votes here, and many of them could now be in play. And according to the most authoritative academic analysis, this area, Stevenage, voted strongly to leave the EU. Another straw in the wind that will make Labour sweat. At last week's local elections, Labour started the night with five of the six Stevenage seats on Hertfordshire County Council. By morning, they'd lost three, the Conservatives. Now, although Stevenage is home to plenty of London commuters, it's just 25 minutes on the train to King's Cross. It's by no means just a dormitory town. There are plenty of organisations and companies that do business here. One such is the Wine Society, a cooperative that's been making its members happy by the bottle or the case since 1874. Where better then to assemble a group of politically engaged local residents who at one time or another have all voted Labour to taste test the current political offerings? The Wine Society provided us with some politically themed wines. The first item on our agenda was to pick one to accompany our discussion. What about uh, Domaine Le Bourri? Three votes. Right, we'll put that forward. That's, that's going to be hard to beat, I think. I'm very glad to say. It's got a screw top. I suppose if you were to put me on a line, I'd probably be right in the middle of it. I'd probably be fairly central. Um, you could argue maybe slightly leaning to the right, but uh, I'm open to, to listening to what people have to say, really, and, and, and seeing uh, as to whether that's something I'd want to vote for. Um, in the past, I've mainly voted either Liberal Democrats or Green. Right. So I'd say I'm fairly Liberal. Probably as I've got older, I've changed. I've been a Labour voter, I've been a Liberal Democrat voter, and I've been a Tory voter. I've probably veered a little, a lot more towards the Liberal Democrats, being more sort of centre ground. And, and what about, how do you view the Labour Party at the moment? Do you see them as someone you might be giving your vote to at this election? I view the Labour Party as a lot of very different people who have come together with a common aim. You know, I don't think we should see the Labour Party as one individual person. We are a large group who come together and band together with a common aim to achieve what we want. I, I'm sort of suspending my decision until I know a bit more about what, about what they want to do. But at the moment, for me, it's very much a leadership election. Well, to be absolutely honest with you, for the longest time I didn't. I was one of these people who didn't pay much attention to politics. And it's only within the past few years where I've noticed how it's affecting the people around me that I've taken a real interest in it. And I'm now a fully paid up member of the Labour Party because Jeremy Corbyn actually grabbed hold of me, as it were, and, and spoke to me. And all those things that I was unhappy about, I heard he was the same. How do you feel the Labour Party at this election? Are they somebody who might end up I voting? I wouldn't for? dream whatsoever of voting for the Labour Party as it stands at the moment. I don't think he may well have, you know, great qualities in Jeremy Corbyn. I think the country needs somebody that has gravitas. I think the country needs somebody that can actually take everybody with it. That's about being, lead, being a leader. I think the shadow cabinet is something at the moment that I couldn't entertain um, voting for, whether it's um, John McDonnell. All of the, I think, the front bench team don't have, for me, anything that gives me any belief that what they say I can believe and what they say they will do, and I think we would be a laughing stock on the world stage. What's going to inform your vote at this election? 
the focus on our services within the country. I know there's a whole big talk about Brexit and it seems to be an election about Brexit at the minute. You've got Conservatives saying they're the ones that are going to push for it where the other parties wouldn't. But I feel like we're losing track of the, you know, the services around our, our local towns and the country and the NHS and things like that. So that's going to be what's important for me. I voted to leave um, because I, I think Europe was a con. It wasn't, I didn't vote because there's too many people coming in or all the rest of it. It's a boss's club and I'm not a boss so I didn't want to be involved in it. I think if you go to a negotiation, you need to have a clear idea of what you want and what you're trying to achieve. Uh, and you, what you don't want is being undermined uh, by your own party or by the, the people who are supporting you. And I haven't seen much evidence of that up until now. I'd like to say, pick up something that Charlie said earlier on, is that actually the general election isn't all about Brexit. Brexit is important, but we're going to soon, if we're not careful, we'll lose sight of all the other things that we actually need to fix in this country and, and do. But Brexit, we have a job to do. We need somebody that's got strong leadership and somebody that actually has a job and gets on and does it. And Theresa May, do you think she has leadership qualities? Um, I think you certainly know what she wants to achieve. Uh, and I think she certainly has more uh, support of her party than, than, for example, Jeremy Corbyn may do. Uh, but again, this, this five, six weeks, I think, is, uh, is the chance to, to show what they're trying to achieve and how they're going to do it. Mm. That was our own, and I have to say, very unscientific gathering of local voters. There is, of course, another month to the general election, so everything is still in play, even if the polls suggest otherwise. That's it from here. It's back now 200 miles up the A1 to Evan in Bishop Auckland. Thank you, David. Hello again. Well, look, while we've been on air, it's actually emerged that President Trump over in the States has sacked James Comey, the director of the FBI. Apparently, this is on the advice of the Attorney General uh, Jeff Sessions there. Well, our diplomatic editor, Mark Urban, is back in the studio in London and actually joins us now. Mark, um, how did this news break? Well, remarkably, Evan, about a half an hour ago from the White House press secretary, Sean Spicer. Uh, the uh, correspondence was then released. President Trump sending a letter to Director Comey saying he had been terminated and in a typical Trumpian fashion thanking him for saying he wasn't a subject of the investigation into his campaign's Russia ties and putting the onus really on his Attorney General. The Attorney General's letter was released. That put the onus on the Deputy Attorney General who actually said the director of the FBI was being fired because he had declared Hillary Clinton to be eff effectively in the clear last summer on the email saga and that shouldn't have been done by an FBI director, said the Deputy Attorney General in this letter. It should have been done by the Justice Department. OK. Where, where, where does this leave the FBI, Mark? Well, locked, as you can see, in this battle with the Justice Department. Whoever succeeds, there is this trial going on. It is a bureaucratic trial for dominance. The Justice Department plays that role, if you like, of the Director of Public Prosecutions in this country. They decide these things at this incredibly sensitive time when the FBI is investigating allegations of ties between President Trump's campaign and Russian intelligence. And, and there's also, of course, the whole political background to this. People on all sides of this uh, have been blaming Comey. I mean, Hillary Clinton blamed him for flip-flopping on the emails issue just before the election. An extraordinary crisis, really, uh, leaving big questions for whoever takes the helm at the FBI about how they keep the Russia investigation credible. Mark, thanks. Well, I dare say we'll have more on that tomorrow. But that's it for tonight. I hope you've enjoyed our tour of the UK and thank you to all those who've been hosting us. But in case you didn't know, today it was the first day of nominations. If you want to stand as a candidate in the general election, you have until Thursday at 4pm to make your intentions known in writing to a returning officer. We dug up a little guide as to how to do that in the Pathé Library, which we feel hasn't dated at all since 1950. Good night. Any potential candidate must be a British subject, over 21, and sponsored by 10 voters in the district. He must deliver his nomination papers to the returning officer and deposit £150 in cash as proof of his serious intention.
This is a precaution against the waste of public time and money. Three candidates are dissuaded by this deposit because the money is forfeited if the candidate fails to poll more than one-eighth of the total votes cast. Let us think before we vote. And if you can't think, well then, don't vote. But in fact, few independent candidates are freaks. Often they are well-known public figures. For example, Commander Stephen King Hall. Good evening. The skies are clear. It's turning chilly. But the good news is that Wednesday is looking beautiful across most of the UK, but it will be a chilly start. These are the temperatures first thing on Wednesday in city centres. Spin that around. Two degrees just outside of town, and that's cold enough for some grass frost in a few areas. So it starts off beautiful, and that's how it's going to stay all day long. But mind the sunshine. It's very strong this time of the year, just as strong as it is in July. So you might burn if you're out for any lengthy period of time. There will be a bit of cloud around across northern parts of Scotland and maybe a few spots of rain. But other than that, it is looking like it's going to be a stunning afternoon and a fine evening on the way as well, Wednesday night into Thursday. And then it is all change from Thursday onwards. We are anticipating thicker clouds to drift in from the southwest already on Wednesday morning. We'll start to see those clouds building, maybe some showers as well affecting the southern counties, perhaps some of them moving into Wales, possibly the Midlands as well, but most of them should be light. Many of us will have a dry and again, a fairly sunny day on Thursday with humidity rising. You will notice that humidity. Certainly by the time we get to Friday, it'll feel quite close out there. And there is a risk of some thunderstorms developing almost anywhere across England and Wales. But those temperatures, despite the cloud and the rain, still will be getting up to around 19 degrees in the south, mid-teens in the north. But if you can, that's for now. Just enjoy Wednesday's weather. That's it for me. Bye-bye. How's this for an adventure? Dara O'Brien and Ed Byrne on the road to Mandalay. Come along for the ride. How are you, Dad? For soon, you will be king. 